Hey everyone, Chris Sawyer here. The Varietal Show is back. Welcome. I am right here with Donine Dyer, and we're at Dyer Vineyards here in Napa Valley. Welcome um, to Napa Valley. Um, Welcome to Napa Valley. <laughs> yes, I love Donine's spirit. Um, I gotta say one thing, you guys are watching the 100th episode of The Varietal Show. So thank you once again for all the great following and I hope you're learning a lot from me and the wonderful people that I hang out with. Um, I gotta say one thing, you know, I really, you know, there are a lot of people to choose as my 100th per person that I really interviewed for my show. And Donine and I had an amazing conversation recently and it was for the Napa Valley Vintners, and it was really about Appalachians and you know how Napa Valley became the first Appalachian on the West Coast and pretty much the second in America. But what were the lines and what were they thinking? And we had the best talk. I mean, I just couldn't stop it. You know, like, Chris called me and said, "Do you have fifteen minutes to yeah, talk about an this hour and a half later?" <laughs> yeah, that's right. But uh, you know what? It was a damn good hour and a half. Um, the fact is that Donine is an amazing person and one of the reasons I really wanted to showcase her to not just because of this wine which is amazing as you'll find out in a moment but Donine has been here for almost 50 years and being a Modesto um, uh, native native Californian <laughs> Modesto where my grandfather also lived and, and worked for the Gallows um, you know it's a really special thing when she came here in 1974 she went to work for Robert Mondavi. Robert Mondavi's winery was less than 10 years old, you guys. Mm -hmm. Get get this whole concept here. Mm -hmm. When she next winery that she worked at was Inglenook, 1975. 1976 was a big year. She got hired by a winery that invested in California land, and that is called Domaine Chandon. Anyone ever hear of that? That is a French uh, champagne house and really did something amazing that really kind of revolutionized this whole area. Not only did they start making sparkling wine here with her at the helm, but they also really started designing vineyards in places where they really weren't before. And they inspired people to plant grapes where they really weren't before. And probably to the maybe as big of a credit as I will give Domaine Chandon over anything and why Napa Valley is what it is, they started a restaurant. And that restaurant, Etois, has been the biggest difference because you would come through Napa Valley here and you'd, you'd yeah. stop in Yachtville, yeah. you might get gas and you might go to the little Mexican um, uh, bar, but that was it. There was nothing there. Today, it's the place. Um, and if Etois hadn't have been there, I don't know where we'd be today, to be really honest. And it's pretty amazing. It was amazing. really kind of a kickoff for the food scene in the, in, in Napa Valley. We exactly. It twelve there, and certainly that's where Sally Schmidt started. Exactly. The that's the French Laundry, the, the original. French, yep. Yeah, and then the French Laundry. and uh, Yeah, yeah. It, it really became something. And, you know, I give uh, Donine a lot of credit. She also hired some amazing people. Let's give Ken Bernard's. I, I so, really can't cook. Yeah. <laughs> Or at least not like that. Yeah. <laughs> but she could make some wine. And uh, that was the thing. And you really put, I mean, that was really the first big investment by the French, you know, in this area. And, you know, it also inspired like Rotor to come up to Anderson Valley and Gloria Ferrer to start over there. And, you know, uh, Mum Napa to start. And, and, you know, all these kinds of places that you go through. And it was just, it was a big deal, you guys. And that's why just sitting here with her, it's so fun. So we talked a lot about the Appalachians. I mean, what was it like back then in the old days? Um, so let, let me stop for one second before we get into this. So 1976, like I said, when she started, there was also another thing that happened in 1976, you guys. You might remember this thing called the Paris Tasting. Mm -hmm. The Paris Tasting happened in 1976. And this was a very big thing that her and I were talking about a lot. Um, and that was when Warren Wernowski and... and you know, Stag Sleep Wine Cellars and uh, Chateau Montalena won these amazing awards uh, that really set a precedence. It really started fusing together something that was already kind of starting, and that was investments, other investments in this area. It really started big, didn't it? I mean, once it started oh, going after that. Once it started, it really started. And I think something interesting, we talked about the other day, but something to me that's very, very interesting is that 
up until that point, and, and really even through much of the 80s, our reference points in Napa Valley were French. French, so yeah. When we were when we when we were making a Cabernet, we had Bordeaux in the back of yes. our minds. Um, when we were making a Pinot Noir, which we did more than we probably should have <laughs> <in> <laughs> at Valley, that point, yeah, at that point before Carneros, <laughs> yeah. um, we were thinking about Burgundy, and I, I think one of the one of the things that has changed is that that whole kind of validity of the area yes. so that we now kind of understand those types the the difference between varietal and place yes and i think that's a that's a really important um, thing that's happened and i would actually bring that back around a little bit to the experience at domaine chandon yeah where the b because we had the french investment there was no sense that we were going to be the same. I yeah. mean, they, while, while the technique and the methodology and frequently the grapes yeah. were the same, our, our role as winemakers was to understand that unique yep. moment that is that combination yeah. between the terroir and the, and the, the grape varieties and the technology, so yep. you know, a little like using barrels. Sure, yep. we use barrels yep. all over the world for the making of wine, but we, we, we increasingly try to understand what is the unique proposition of any given site. Right. And I, I think those things kind of came together in, in the, um, the, the early ideas of yep. you know of. of we won, we beat them, you know, we're as good as to, you know, or we're better than <laughs> to now it's kind of like we yeah. recognize that there are these differences and that there are reasons why you might sometimes want to drink one versus the other. Right. But you hopefully want to have both of them in yeah. your cellar. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, kind of the topic that my story is on for the Napa Valley Vintners is about the Appalachians here. And so we're not just talking about Napa Valley. So we say Napa Valley Cabernet. Everyone's like, oh my God, I love it. And, you know, most people are like, oh man, I remember this one time I was down Highway 29 and I was going, or I was going down Silverado Trail and there's all these beautiful vineyards and everything. Yes, that, that does exist, you guys. Don't doubt that. But it's more than a valley here. And I think that that's really what you guys took into consideration, why it was so special about what Napa Valley really is, because it's not just the valley, it's also the mountains. And that's really the term Appalachian. When you go to Bordeaux, it's not, Bordeaux is not one thing. It's a lot of small parts yeah. of it inside that boundary. And it's the same thing in Burgundy. And I think that really for us here on the West Coast, this really was the the learning curve that we had to go through napa valley was the test zone we figured it out but when you think about that kind of time period that we were just talking about about robert mondavi starting in 1966 and you know nathan face planting those vineyards in 1961 mm -hmm. and really kind of that was i would say that's kind of like that kind of benchmark where you know we look back over the past you know 60 years and you can go like nathan Fay, like you could say that mm -hmm. might be the mm -hmm. first one where you kind of go okay we really go from there but the fact was that there were vineyards here before, and let's not forget that, and prohibition, and everything that went on, the second appellation that was made, and the first one inside this region, was Howell Mountain. And Howell Mountain, Lahota vineyard up there, goes way, 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 way back uh, to the 1880s. And there were a lot of plantings up here too, in the mountains, and right now we are in Diamond Mountain. And yeah. uh, so tell, let's talk about, so let's get off the valley floor, even though we're kind of close to the valley floor, but we're near Calistoga, we're on the west side, we're in the Mayacamas mountain range. What brought you up here? Well, you, you, you might ask, how did this girl get from the champagne? Producer? Yeah, how did, wait, wait, <laughs> yeah, she, she made producer. all the champagne, so why are we talking Cabernet and, and Cabernet Franc now? So at this point, I have to introduce someone else with yeah. my husband, yes. Bill. So Bill Dyer and I came up here together. We, we actually met in college, and his, um, his direction in winemaking took him into still wines okay. with Sterling Vineyards. Yep. And uh, so as, as, as we were starting to look at transitioning from big winery yep. careers to something a little bit more focused, and, and truly um, 
focused yeah. on what is the significance of place in right. wine. What, yep. what are what are single vineyard wines? Um, Bill had worked with um, fruit on Diamond Mountain, mm -hmm. and we had always lived in Calistoga, yeah. but we were we were we knew people here on Diamond Mountain, and we certainly knew and yeah. were aware of the wines. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, to be a complete and total name dropper. I mean, yeah. here at fifteen oh one Diamond Mountain Road, we're right across the street from Diamond Creek. Diamond Creek, who's another one super of super duper early famous, early, <laughs> and and super famous, but also a very early adopter of that whole idea of the the importance of, of terroir, especially the extent, on the mountains. Yeah, you know. especially on the mountains, where you don't often have large swaths of land that yeah. are consistent yeah. across the board. So you tend to have more of a uh, checkerboard kind of approach. You've yeah. got two, two acres here and four acres there yeah. that will have something in common in yeah. terms of their of their soils. So that's really kind of what drew us to yeah. this to this area. Um, we, we started out looking to, um, to build a house. We were quite frankly a little overemployed. <laughs> but what do two wakers make two winemakers find when they look to build a house? They find a place to plant a yeah, vineyard. Exactly. And Pretty it much, turned yeah. out we knew a whole lot more about vineyards than we did about houses. <laughs> and uh, looking at the site, um, uh, very volcanic, a little bit of variation across it, probably an old rock slide is yep. kind of what we figured when we got in and, and did the, uh, the the ripping. We were pulling up some pretty large boulders, and we all kind of know that even most of what is the, um, the certainly the edges of the Napa Valley yep. are not river, they're not water no. formed, no. so they're, they're formed in another kind of way. And, right. And, Looking at the terrain here, we we think that this is you know a volcanic rock slide a lot of years ago. Yeah, yeah, it didn't, it didn't happen yesterday. It no. didn't happen yesterday. No. That that then has had some good kind of alluvial fill built in on top of that right. that rock material, um, and it's an attractive site. It has a singular site. I yeah. think that one of the things that we know from Appalachians. Is it just because you can give it a name doesn't necessarily mean that it will be yeah. uh, of significance in the long run. Yep. But I, I think sites like this that yep. that do have that kind of combination, you know, very volcanic. But quite frankly, we dry farm up here yep. without too much trouble. Yeah, um, we did it in 2021, which was a ridiculous drought year. Yep. We we dry farmed <laughs> and. Made beautiful wine. We didn't make a lot of it, yeah. but uh, but uh, but you, but you can do it. And I think it's that combination yeah. Yeah. between really really well drained and a certain amount of soil that's got some good yeah. um, water holding capacity mixed in. I love it. Well, you know, it's uh you know just after one o'clock here today. You know, before two. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you know, Calistoga, <laughs> you come here, usually it's pretty damn hot. Um, and then, but then you come here in the, the, you know, the rainy season and there's the most rain in Napa Valley. So you have both of these extremes here, but you up here on Diamond Mountain have exactly what we're experiencing right now. It's called breeze. Yeah. And this breeze is a yeah. really key part to yeah. being up here. Yeah. Yeah. The advent of, the advent of, um, Car thermometers is the greatest thing in the world. I mean, I I can almost tell you that at uh, that at any given time, we're at about 800 feet elevation here, and at any given time of day, we're going to be about three degrees yep. cooler than the valley floor. Yeah. If you go up a lot higher, you start to get inversion layers, yeah. and there are all kinds of other things that play into how that um, yep. how that reads. But here, we're a little bit cooler than the valley floor. Yep. And we do um, we do count on an, a breeze that comes down off of the yep. hills and kind yep. of kind of cools us off at night. We can have those really extreme diurnal swings yep. here um, that the Napa Valley is so famous for, where you can really have you know fifty degrees difference between the lows at night and the highs during yep. the day. Yep. Um, hopefully, we'll keep that up. Exactly. So we got two great wines in front of us here. Uh, which one did you pour on the left? The left is the Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. The left is the Cabernet. And this is the wine. Mm. Th this is a Cabernet mm -mm -mm. blend. It's the 2018. Okay. It's another near-perfect vintage. Yeah. <laughs> it 
re before we uh, go past your fabulous husband too, I will say my first experience being on Diamond Mountain was actually with Sterling a long time ago, and it was with Bob. Um, Bob, what was Bob's last name? Uh, Robert um, Hunter. Robert Hunter when oh, he was the yeah, yeah. winemaker. Yeah. And I, we did a camp, like a kind of sterling camp. Right. And we came up here to that. Cr they've got a crazy vineyard up they here. They do indeed. That's like, a, I mean, it reminds me of the Mosul in, in Germany. It's like, you know, that, ee! And they have they have 125 acres on Diamond Mountain. It's which kind is, of insane, yeah. Which is still one of the largest plantings yeah. in, in the in the ABA. It's a small ABA Diamond yeah, Mountain. Yeah. I mean, I think the... the um, the entire area is um, about 5,000 acres, yeah. and there are a little over 500, I'd say between five and 600 planted right yeah. now. I haven't really added them up recently, but it's there are still things that I think we will see planted in the future going yeah. forward, but there'll be things like two acres here, five acres there. I, I don't think you'll ever see uh, yeah. an, a, a planting like the like. Like no, Sterling. Yeah, but they really went to it, and it was really interesting being up there. I remember that was the first time I really saw Malbec growing. Um, oh, it was yeah. a really good uh, patch of Malbec up there. And then we got to also give a lot of credit to, we were just talking about Diamond Creek. You know, Diamond Creek, um, they purchased this property, really experimental kind of vineyard. They ended up making four different designates from the different blocks inside the property. And they were also the first Napa Valley winery to charge $100 for a bottle. Unbelievable, you guys. Like we used, yeah, believe it, there, there used to be wines that weren't $100 back then, you know, <laughs> before they did it. Uh, but I mean, it's just very special. I mean, you can, what I love about it, here we are, we're sitting at 800 feet, you know, above Napa Valley on the mountain, Diamond Mountain in particular. And you know, it, it smells like it out here and it smells like it in the glass. Um, mm. That's a wonderful thing is like, you know, you don't go out here with power blowers and blow these leaves away. They are part of the soil components too. They break down in this red, um, nice red volcanic soil that we can see from you right here. You can actually see it. You, you can, can actually yeah. see the red color over there. <laughs> and it's real, you guys. But I mean, I think that the fact that, you know, you can really get, the, you're, you're just in somewhere special. And I yeah. feel like just yeah. smelling this wine, I was feeling it, you know. It does have that little, almost like, uh, a moral, you know, like, or one of these kinds of wild mushroom kinds of things going on in it too. There's a, there's a almost new mommy um, going on in just a mouth. Yeah, I, I definitely, definitely always have an umami um, moment with, uh, with the Diamond Mountain cabs. So this is primarily Cabernet Sauvignon, but there is Cabernet Franc in it yep. and about 5% Petit Verdot. Okay. And we, we actually started with all five varieties okay. planted here knowing that Cabernet would be the majority, yes. but kind of wanting to make, wanting wanting to let the site kind of make yeah. the decision yeah. for us what would be the, the best blender. Yes. It hadn't been planted before, right. so it was, it was forested at the time. And gradually, um, I, the Malbec went and the Merlot went, yep. and um, the Petit Verdot never grew the Cabernet Franc, which we'll talk about in yeah. a minute is the one that we found to be truly um, yeah. kind of extraordinary in this uh, in this in this soils and on this site yeah and i you know being two winemakers we we really came at this without a strong stylistic sense i i think that i think that's fair to say we we knew that we weren't going to be we weren't going to go for extremely high sugars. Yeah. But that was not the history of this area right. either. And and certainly the kind of exposition we have doesn't insist right. that you that you have high sugars to right. have ripeness. Yep. So you could get a ripe character with without that. Yep. Um and we knew that we weren't all about um, super extraction. Or, and and a lot of oak that we were looking for a place for the fruit to show its best to express yep. itself yep. well, and that that um, the the biggest challenge I think for us over the years was the taming of the tannins. Yeah. I mean the Diamond Mountain has a real reputation for some kind of for some very very hard edged yeah. tannins, and I think that 
when you look at the fruit characteristics, they're they're a actually at their best when yep. they're fairly elegant. Yeah. Because you don't have the big red berry fruit. Yeah, right. You have a, a darker version. You Correct. have more kind of plum and um, blueberry yep. and currant and you know things that are all the things I like. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. But they're but they but they are a little bit they're they're a little bit darker. Yeah. And um, and they, but they they can really dance quite well. And they can. I, I think when when you taste the Cap Franc, you'll know why it works so well in here because it, yeah. it brings it brings kind of a prettiness yeah. to the. There's no doubt. I mean, I, I I love the way that it feels in my mouth too. The tannins are completely in balance. Uh, there's a lot of fruit. It's very elegant, and it's it's just you know I was thinking about it as like you know almost like um, some uh, Ralph Lauren things. I've been by Ralph Lauren's property in, in Telluride and you just see the models out there, but they're in like nature, you know, they're not yeah. sitting there in front of like, you know, buildings and stuff like this. They're in nature. And that's, that's kind good, of the way I look at it. You know, analogy. you know, yeah. it's just yeah. how it's so beautiful, but it's just, it's posing out here, yeah. you know, and yeah. it's, it's a lovely, lovely wine. You know, that I think it's got so much grace to it and elegance that, you know, sometimes we think about Napa Valley cows as being huge, you know, like they're just big, you know, we got to decamp this forever. We just pop this thing open before we I push play, you know, so yeah. it's tasting extremely good right now. It's it's obviously it's expanding a little bit inside this glass, but the fact is that it, it has its own personality. And I feel like this really, to me, is the Diamond Mountain uh yeah. idea and if yeah. you if you really have a great example of it this is a very good example of it yeah. and it does it has that slight salinity which yes. gives yes exactly makes it very I, I mean I, i'm sure that's minerality of yeah. some sort but it definitely makes it kind of mouth-watering yeah. and very yeah Thank yeah you. yeah you got it no it's it's wonderful you know you told me that um you know when we get in uh von strasser rudy von strasser a great man and, um, you know, he, he was really the one that said, let's make this an Appalachian. Yeah. And you guys got on board and you made it really clear that you have to, when you do that, there's a whole lot of paperwork and you have to prove, A, that you've got unique climate conditions, uh, soil types. You've got history, history. Uh, yeah. history then and history now. So you have to bring it back, both context. And, you know, Rudy had been over in Bordeaux. He'd seen these kinds of Appalachians. And he was really good at this, and he really got you guys together. But you made one really big comment: you had to make sure everyone was on board. <laughs> yeah, before you yeah. go, before you go to the TTP, yeah, 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 yeah. Fill out the yeah, yeah. yeah because you, if someone's not on board, and there, this has happened, and there's, and you know, there. If you read the article that I write for um, Napa Valley Vintners, it's it's very interesting because there were some things. There were parts of this, um, the the mountains that. You know, some people didn't think we're part of it um, and uh, that's probably the eastern parts uh, but it, it is and there are reasons for it and you know it was more of a group effort than an individual effort and that's why these things happen and it really set up um, the foundation for complete success in all these areas um, yeah you know yeah I mean we talk we, we talk about that a lot that whole thing about um, you know diamond Dyer Vineyard, Diamond Mountain, Napa Valley, yeah. California, yeah. and you know they, the the question of which one should be the boldest, the biggest, the, and I think in that list, Napa Valley is the one that pops to the front. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. if you just want to, if, if if you want to find the place where you capture the most people, single vineyard designated wines, small audience, yeah. Diamond Mountain, yeah. more. Napa Valley, yeah. huge, maybe even huger than California. Yeah, and then Mayacamas, and you said taste of Mayacamas yeah. is like something that you participate in when it happens. Yeah, and it's not just here; it's also Spring Mountain, Mount yeah, Veeder, yeah. and you've really got. We're on the Mayacamas, you know, and if we were over there in Howl Mountain or if we were in Atlas Peak, we'd be talking about Vaca Mountains, and yeah. you could do the same exact thing over there, but it's different. This is woody. If you, anytime you come down here, it's great because it, 
it's just such different looks on Vaca Mountains is completely different than this mountain over here. And they run parallel with each other, basically going uh, north to south, you know. And what I always like about the Vac or sorry, the Mayacamas Mountains is I always call it the spine. Its spine comes right out of the bay and yeah. it just goes like yeah. this. Yeah. Vaca Mountains kind of keeps going for a while and it, and it really does kind of um, set up some more things. And it's actually blocking basically um you know sacramento um the whole sacramento valley out so, there which yeah. way do you think that is just out of curiosity that so, way is um well northeast is yeah that's pretty much straight north straight north okay so, because the napa yeah. valley does that little western band that's right the right western band yeah bo yeah. barrett yeah. bo barrett was very clear about yeah, that yeah, western sure. band yeah uh, bo barrett from chateau montalena who's also in my article he had to make a, a whole point about that western yeah, that a turn right that about it takes. Yeah, the state park. The yeah. whole valley yeah. kind yeah. of switches to the west, yeah. and that that opens up to yeah. the to different gaps. Yeah, than just it's kind of I, I don't know the... because I was coming up a road like this to get here, so don't don't blame me for making that <laughs> no, mistake. No, no, no. <laughs> it was a setup deal. <laughs> but you know, I just I think this cabernet is so great. And, you know, uh, it's interesting because uh, Steve Mathiasen told me once, he said, you know, Chris, you could grow Cabernet anywhere in, in Napa Valley. But there are places where it really gets the best expression and it's not used in kind of components where you put it together into one. You know, might, some might be from Yachtville yeah. and some might be from up here and you put it all together in one. This is a very unique area. But he also said one thing about Merlot that you really can't grow in very many places here. So you <laughs> Which know, is sort of an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I mean, I mean, there's a there's, I, I wouldn't even call it a debate.